Okay, to continue on with our discussion, uh, we're going to actually take a look at symbolic or non-material culture to start with. All right, so, to understand what symbolic culture means, we should uh, take a look at the definition of what the meaning of a, or the definition of what a symbol is. A symbol is anything in a society with some type of attached meaning. Um, that's a very broad definition, obviously, uh, but you could kind of uh, add to that the idea that uh, it is up for interpretation, um, but for the most part when we talk about, especially across a culture, a uh, cultural symbol, we usually acknowledge that cultural symbols are widely uh, acknowledged and uh, looked at and the agreed meaning is uh, uh, agreed upon by the majority of people in the society. So let me just give you a quick example, and again the kind of crude drawing that I'm able to do. Not too bad. You can take a look at that and I were to say to you, what does that symbol mean? All right, the vast majority of you would probably say that means stop. Okay? Uh, I did not write the word stop in there, although if I did use those that would be another example of symbols. Uh, but for right now, we can just say that the idea of a red octagon, or an eight-sided figure, in our society, pretty much universally means stop. And then I'll usually ask students, where have you seen that symbol before? The uh, most obvious example is we see it when we see uh, on road signs. Okay? And when I say, when you see that on a road sign, what do you do? And you're driving, obviously. You bring your vehicle to a halt. But is that the only place you see that sign? No, we've seen it on doors. And when you see that on a door, it typically means that you're not supposed to go in there or that you're supposed to change your direction or that access to whatever area that lies beyond it is denied to you. So we definitely know that uh, the symbol means stop. Uh, we take that as a universal. And once again, we pretty much agree that to be a member of society means you have to have been exposed to that symbol and you agree what it means along with the rest of society. So, and again, please don't try this at your next uh, traffic stop, but let's say you were driving and went right past one of these and a police officer pulled you over and said, hey, did you see that stop sign? Would it be a valid point for you to say, yeah, I saw it, I just don't know what it means? Okay, of course not. The, the, officer is going to challenge you on that and say, uh, were you born in this country? Do you understand our rules? Do you speak English? All those kind of questions which we regard as being, like I said, very kind of ethnocentric. But what the officer is trying to get at is it's not acceptable for you to live in our society and not recognize what this symbol means or to say that you don't agree with what it means based on your own uh, preferences uh, we all agree to, to operate in society, to be a member of this society, that that symbol means stop. Okay? So when we talked about some of the things that we uh, agree make up symbols in our society, uh, we can come up with all sorts of different uh, examples. And I'm not going to run through an exhaustive list here, but I'm definitely going to give you uh, some. Okay. These are off the list of things that we talked about in the last uh, segment of this lecture. We can definitely take a look at gestures, okay? These are movements of body. Uh, they're often used as shorthand versions of trying to explain uh, what we're trying to get across to people. Um, I usually use a bunch of different examples. I'm gonna kind of tone it down a little bit for this one uh, for a video lecture. But uh, we definitely know all sorts of different uh, gestures that we use uh, in society. Uh, for example, going back to my uh, example of being in London, if we were to be uh, on a busy public street and I was to knock into somebody or step on somebody's foot, uh, I might get this gesture. All right. And not being from the society, I might not take that very difficult. I don't know what that person's doing. Uh, in fact, I might be confused and say, is that person giving me the peace sign? Okay, or I could ask somebody, what does this mean? And various cultures would say, that means peace. Another culture would say, that means two. Uh, and various um, uh, 
European, South American uh, societies in which obviously uh, soccer or football uh, is very, this is victory. So we definitely know that the same gesture can have different meanings, but if I was in England and someone were to give me that exact same gesture but reversed, that actually means the same thing in the United States as giving somebody this gesture, okay? which we definitely know is a, is a very strong gesture which has a lot of attached meaning to it. So when we see that gesture, we have a very strong physical reaction to that. We tend to get very either angry or scared or upset when we see that. Although, if you remember, I told you it means the exact same thing as this in the, that other culture, and yet we don't have a reaction. So once again, a gesture is a very strong way of exemplifying what uh, the attached meaning to different gestures are. So uh, once again, we can definitely point to the idea that different gestures mean different things to different cultures. So if you go around the world, uh, it's very important, in fact there's been a lot of books written on this for world travelers, uh, to uh, make sure that you understand the body language and gestures that are appropriate to a specific society. Another couple of quick examples. Um, let's say you were having dinner in an Italian restaurant in Italy, okay, uh, and the waiter comes, and as waiters usually do, they wait until your mouth is full. So you have a mouthful of delicious spaghetti or pasta that you're really enjoying, and the waiter comes and asks you how your meal is, and you answer with the gesture, Clearly in our society, we take that as okay, or everything's fine. Um, however, in Italy, you have just referred to the waiter as uh, an anus. So uh, knowing that and understanding that gesture is a very important thing. Um, I'll often, often sometimes in a classroom, uh, take a pen or some other object, uh, walk over to a student and hand it to them and then ask them to hand it back to me using a specific hand. You'll notice I stepped in front so you can see. Uh, and then ask anybody what their reaction was to that interaction. And most people's faces will be completely blank until I explain that if we were uh, in an Arabic culture, that would have been one of the most horrible things I could have done because basically I offered somebody something and accepted something using my left hand, okay? Uh, the left hand in many cultures around the world is uh, what was politely described as your defecation hand, or the hand that you use to clean yourself after you've gone to the toilet, and to show somebody, or much less offer something or take something from somebody with your left hand is considered extremely vulgar and an insult. So we can definitely see that gestures have lots of different meanings in lots of different ways. Uh, one of the other things we listed when we talked about symbolic culture was definitely the idea of language. Uh, we know that a language is basically a system of symbols. Or a symbols system. Uh, we just use the language that I'm using with you right now, English. We could say, what are the symbols that make up the English language? Well, the most basic system of symbols is our alphabet. So A, B, C, D, E, F, everything. And we combine those symbols to make words. We combine words to make sentences. We combine sentences to come up with ideas. So we definitely know that language is a system of symbols. Uh, the most important thing that we sometimes add, uh, I usually ask, is there a difference between language and communication? And there very much is. Uh, we know that lots of other living organisms uh, communicate with one another. We know that animals communicate, we know to a certain degree, uh, insects, plants all communicate, but do any of those have what we truly call language? And again, there's lots of different um, um, debates about this, uh, but as sociologists and social scientists, we generally agree that uh, human beings are the sole uh, organism on the planet that truly has a system of language. And the reason we say that is because, of, again, we definitely know that language is a system of symbols, but it allows us to communicate abstract thoughts. You can say to be communicated. 
once again, I'll often hear students argue, I communicate with my dog, or I know what my dog is saying to me. Uh, you know, clearly, I have a dog as well, and when I come home, my dog barks, and it is up to me then to interpret those barks. It is up to me to decide what he's barking about. Uh, now, if I know my dog very well, I can say, yes, okay, I know his dinner bark, I know his I need to go out bark, but is that truly language? We would say no, that is communication. Uh, the dog is trying to express something and we have to then interpret that communication uh, based on what our knowledge of that situation is. Um, but when we talk about language, language is much more specific in its ability to communicate abstract thoughts. Uh, it allows us to, first of all, language is definitely cumulative. Uh, we build on the language that came before us. So we learn a language, uh, but every generation adds words, subtracts words. Uh, despite the fact that I'm speaking English to you now, I could also make the case for would a person of approximately 200 years ago uh, be speaking English as well, but be using many of the same words? Of course not. They'd be using completely different words. And were I to go back in time and speak to somebody in English from 200 years ago, I would use words that they have absolutely no understanding of what the meaning is. So language is definitely cumulative in that we build on it, change it, adapt it. And in fact, those changes then make changes to our culture. All right? uh, but when we talk about this idea for abstract thoughts, we definitely know that it allows for communication about specific ideas and dimensions that simple communication does not allow for, we as human beings in the possession of language can communicate about the past. Okay, I can ask you what you did yesterday and you were able to share that to me. In other words, our history uh, again, animals not able to do that. I can't come home and ask my dog what he did while I wasn't there. Um, we can share our present with each other or our perspective. And once again, above a simple view of, you know, like I said, does my dog want to go out? Is that why he's barking? But I can actually ask you about your thoughts about what is going on around us. So I can ask you specifically, are you hurt? Do you feel hungry? What do you think about something that I've just said? that's sharing our present or sharing our perspective with each other. And then, of course, we can share future plans with each other. We often call that planning. So once again, I cannot, I can speak to my dog in these terms, and I definitely do. Tomorrow we're going to go to the dog park, but I don't think he understands that, nor will he make adjustments in his behavior to share that idea with me. Okay? So while I can certainly give that impression to him, he will not understand what I'm talking about. Whereas we as human beings can say, what are you going to do tomorrow? Or let's get together this weekend. Or let's plan for this event coming up at some time in the future. Again, these are all abstractions. And language just allows us to communicate these things. And probably the most important thing that language allows human beings to do is engage in goal-oriented behavior. So in other words, by using the past, present, and future and our ability to communicate in these dimensions, we can engage in complex behavior which allows us to achieve things that no other living organism on this planet is able to achieve. So if I talk about uh, what are some of the greatest human inventions of all time or some of the greatest human accomplishments, and I hear things like the wheel and fire, or even if I say what were some of the, uh, the, uh, uh, the great wonders of the world, and people talk about the Great Wall of China or the pyramids in Egypt, Basically, all those things come down to the idea of human beings learning and using language as a way of achieving things. None of those things would have been possible if human beings weren't able to communicate with each other in abstract ways. So we definitely look at the idea of how important language is to human beings. All right, I'm going to continue on a little bit more. Uh, three very important things we talk about. values, norms, and sanctions. 
once again, we're going to go into a lot more detail about these, especially values, in the next segment of this lecture. But we can go through the definitions of these now. Values are ideas that human beings have, or people have, about what is desirable. So things that we think are quote unquote good, okay? Um, when a society determines uh, that things, certain things are valuable or values to us, uh, we basically say that these are the things that we uh, agree on as a culture are, are desirable things, things that we want. So I often ask again classes, what is an example of an American value? And almost always to a T, one of the things that comes back automatically is freedom. And that's absolutely correct. Okay, we as a society value freedom. So we would say freedom is the concept to be able to do what you want and not have other people tell you what to do or restrict your ability to make decisions. And that is something that our society finds highly desirable. So we would put that down as a cultural value. Okay? Norms are, for the most part, rules that support values. Okay, and we can say that these rules can be spoken or unspoken, written or unwritten, formal or informal, lots of different ways of putting it. Uh, typically when we take the idea of a norm and we write it down, then we're usually talking about a law in a society. But there's plenty of norms that aren't written down, they're just things, there's rules. Um, and we'll get into that much more throughout the course of the semester. But when we basically talk about norms, we're talking about ideas or behaviors that support values. Okay? So if I were to say to you, uh, we know that freedom is an American value, what is a norm that supports that value? We could say uh, the Bill of Rights, okay? uh, the first uh, amendments to the Constitution. So we say that there are rules in our society that guarantee us uh, freedom of speech and freedom of religion and freedom of assembly. So, in fact, the word freedom is part of those, uh, those written, now in those cases, certainly written rules, but those are norms which support that value. And then we talk about sanctions are basically society's reactions to norms. So, again, the reason that these three terms are often presented together is because of their close interrelation. So we say that sanctions are reactions to norms. So uh, there are rules in society that support values, and when we follow those rules, we get what we call positive sanctions, and another word for that is rewards. And when we break norms or violate norms, then we usually uh, are given negative sanctions. Another word for that, of course, is punishments. So uh, again, an example of, uh, so let's change gears here real quick. Um, so another value in our society is uh, being productive. Okay? We say that in our society everybody should constantly be trying to achieve or work for uh, accomplishing things. Um, there are all sorts of rules set up for doing that. So we typically norms in our society would be things like everybody should have a job or a career in our society. And then when you go to your job or your career and you perform that behavior on a Friday, what do you generally expect, or every other week, depending on what type of job you have? Right, you usually get a paycheck or a salary, okay? And we say that is your positive sanction for having engaged in norms which support a value, all right? Uh, again, it's easier to think of the negative ones. Let's go back to freedom for a second. So we know that freedom is a, 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 a value in our society, the ability not to have other people make you do things against your will. Uh, there are definitely norms for that, all sorts of laws about what freedoms we have. If I were to come up to you, force you into a car, and take you somewhere you didn't want to go, I would be guilty of the crime of kidnapping, correct? I would be forcing you to do something against your will or for violating your freedom. So then the negative sanction would be uh, being arrested and being probably put in jail for that, okay? So we definitely know that values are ideas about uh, what a society finds desirable. Norms are the rules that support those ideas, and sanctions are the reactions that we have, both positive and negative, to people following those norms. Okay? Uh, with that goes a couple of other, these are kind of subsections, 
Uh, we de definitely talk about, when we talk about values, norms, and sanctions, sometimes you'll hear the term folkways. Okay? These are norms that we typically think of being not very strictly enforced. Okay? Uh, so again, norms which go against, um, or I'm sorry, norms that uh, have different interpretations, different meanings. Uh, they're usually not written down. They're usually not considered on the level of laws. They're just kind of quote unquote things we know. We are going to talk about this in some detail in a future module here. Uh, but uh, I can think of some examples. You will often hear things like, especially fashion, a lot of times comes with uh, things like both ways. Okay, uh, not wearing white shoes after Labor Day. Okay, or uh, violating fashion rules. Uh, some people will say uh, you don't wear a tie with a short sleeve shirt. Okay. With those ideas, wearing white shoes after Labor Day, wearing a tie with a short sleeve shirt, are you breaking the laws? No. Are you going to get a ticket or wind up with uh, prison uh, as a consequence of doing that? No. But a lot of times the reactions to people violating both ways are, um, so again, uh, somebody giving you a, a snotty look or somebody rebuking you for violating a folk way. So again, both ways are norms which are not strictly enforced, open to wide interpretations. Um, sometimes we hear another term called mores. And it looks like it's just pronounced, or it looks like it's spelled like the term, the word more, but the E is pronounced mores. These are uh, values which are sometimes considered pretty critical to society. So if we were to come up with in the, the next lecture, uh, video segment, we're going to talk specifically about American values uh, and the importance of them. When we talk about mores in a society, we usually uh, consider uh, rules that are essential to our core values. So a lot of times when we hear about things like the Bill of Rights, uh, when we talk about the essential uh, rules in a society which support the core values, we're usually talking about this idea of mores. And then the very last word that will often come up in conjunction with these topics, and I'm sure you've probably heard about this before, is the idea of taboos. Okay. Um, again, a taboo is related to the idea of a norm. It's a standard of behavior that society says we should engage in. But taboos have kind of a specific meaning in that when we violate uh, some norms in society, the reaction of society is so uh, based on things like revulsion or the idea of um, uh, disgust that people who break taboos are usually considered in some ways to be unfit for participation in society. Uh, again, some very specific examples are things like uh, cannibalism or incest. Okay? Usually when we hear those terms, even those terms themselves carry kind of an icky factor to them. We hear them and we go, Ugh. and that's typically the reaction we're looking for when we hear about people violating taboos is the idea that uh, they have broken a rule which is just considered so fundamental to society uh, that you know, breaking that rule can sometimes result in people uh, being um, in some way shunned from the rest of society or uh, people have said that they're basically unfit to uh, participate in society. Okay? There is one other section I want to cover real quickly and that is the idea and the distinction between <coughs> within society, we definitely know there's one kind of overall culture, so, oh, sorry, spelling that wrong, <clears throat> and another term I'll come up with in a second, the idea of subcultures. Subcultures are cultures that exist within a culture at large. So when we talk about kind of a world within a larger culture, um, a lot of times when we talk about subcultures, we're talking about groups uh, within uh, uh, the culture at large. But the main distinction between subcultures, what we're going to talk about uh, in just a second, is the idea of a subculture for the large part is generally considered compatible with the culture at large. So when you're talking about jobs or occupations or hobbies, activities, religions, interests. Lots of people gather in groups within society to engage in what we call subcultural activity. Um, in other words, they're going to uh, get together with people with like-minded interests, thoughts, beliefs, uh, goals, 
And for the most part, though, we say that those subcultures contribute, or at the very least, don't conflict with the society at large. So if you were a bunch of, let's say, uh, you're a nursing student now, and someday in the future you're planning to be in an LPN uh, or an RN, and you're working in a hospital, and you get together with your fellow nurses on Friday, and you go out for you know, a pitcher of margaritas and nachos at happy hour, and you're going to talk about probably what? You're going to talk about work, and you're going to talk about uh, the people, the doctors that you interact with, and the patients that are on your floor, and the procedures that you're doing, and the equipment that you're using. And for the most part, anyone listening in who don't are part of that subculture may find it actually pretty difficult to understand the subculture itself. They won't understand the words or the terminologies that you're using. But you as a society, you as a, as a group within society, are supporting the society at large. Okay? So the distinction between a subculture and what we call a counterculture is the idea of your attitude about the culture at large. A counterculture or countercultures are groups within a society, very much like subcultures, that get together usually for the purposes of common interests, goals, values. But for the most part, at least one or sometimes many of the activities that they engage in oppose the culture at large. Okay? So when we talk about counterculture, we talk about the idea of um, groups that uh, in some way oppose the, the, the culture at large or aspects of it. Uh, they're usually regarded negatively by the culture at large, sometimes even perceived as a threat. Uh, a lot of times I use musical movements as ways of exemplifying countercultures. For a long time in the 1960s, it was what we sometimes call the hippie counterculture, uh, based on music and drugs and free love uh, that were against some of the larger values being held by society at the time. They were regarded with distrust and hostility in a lot of cases. In the 1970s, you can talk about punk rock culture, uh, which is largely considered anti-capitalist, anti-government, um, so it was widely regarded uh, uh, negatively by the culture at large. Um, in the 90s into the 2000s, you could say hip-hop and rap culture was considered counterculture. Okay? They opposed, uh, obviously, what they considered to be, and we'll talk about this in a much later uh, uh, section, um, you know, uh, institutionalist racism, uh, as well as just uh, you know, uh, anti-countercultural anti movements. So, when we talk about the difference between subcultures and countercultures, we're talking about uh, what is largely considered to be accepted by society as opposed to uh, opposed by society.